12,000 years ago, the human population was only around 2.5 million. 2,000 years ago, that number was only up to 190 million. That means in 10,000 years, the population only increased by 187.5 million people. Fast forward to the early 1800s, and the population was just breaching the 1 billion mark. A little over a century after that, in the 1920s, the population had doubled into 2 billion. 40 years after that, in 1960, another billion had been added. After only 14 years, in 1974, the Earth held 4 billion people. 5 billion came in 1987, only 13 years after. 6 billion was hit in 1999, 12 years later, and another 12 years after that, in 2011, the planet saw its 7th billion person. Today, in 2018, only 7 years after this, the world population is at 7.6 billion and is expected to reach 8 billion by 2024. This rate of growth is exponential, and while it has slowed down slightly, this still leaves a massive population with increasing needs for food, water, and living space. Most of these new populations come from developing countries where the quality of life and average incomes are rising just as fast. As a result, the demand for higher cost products and foods are rising as well, and forests all over the world are being cleared to feed the bolstering populations here. It's estimated that even if our population only increases by one-third, we'll need to increase our agricultural output by 70% to make up for the increasing appetites of developing nations. This, of course, has a tremendous negative impact on the natural world, causing the degradation of what remains of our natural resources. And there is a limit to how much food we can produce, even if we cut down all of the rainforests, fished the entire ocean, and ate every last morsel of food produced, we still might not be able to accommodate the incoming populations. If we're going to harbor this many people without global food shortages and protect the environment, we're going to need a new way to grow more food. Luckily, we have one. You might not like it, but here's my case for insect agriculture. Okay, okay, hear me out. This is a really good idea with a slew of great benefits that should not be ignored. I know they're kinda gross, but let me explain. Of all the land used for agriculture, a whopping 70% of it is used as pastures for raising livestock, with cattle being the main user of land and resources. As I've mentioned in a previous video, the main reason forests like the Amazon are being cleared is to make space for cattle ranching, to feed growing global demand for beef and other protein products. This is not only a highly damaging process, but in some places it's irreversible as well. To make matters worse, 18% of all greenhouse gas emissions produced globally comes from livestock, which heavily contributes to climate change. Also, massive amounts of crop production, about 36% of US corn harvest, and 75% of global soybean production goes to feeding livestock alone. In fact, a third of all arable land is used to grow crops that only feed livestock. So, when farmers in Brazil clear the Amazon rainforest to make room for cattle pastures, more forest must also be cleared for fields to feed the cattle. Not to mention, the meats that come from cows and other animals are dense with fats and high in calories and contribute to conditions such as obesity and heart disease. Animal meats can also transmit diseases like H1N1 or Salmonella, and as a result, more resources must be spent to ensure the quality and safety of the meats we eat. But insects have none of these problems. First, insects being smaller and capable of living at many different layers with other insects require far less space for the same amount of food production. Different insects have different space requirements, but on the whole, they always compare favorably against larger animals. With the increased land use efficiency, we would be able to feed the world without clearing any more forest and even possibly restore some of it that has already been cleared. Insects can even be farmed in urban environments if need be. Then, insects produce negligible amounts of greenhouse gases, while cows and other other animals produce methane and ammonia through cellular respiration. Besides termites, no farmed insect is known to release either methane or ammonia. Replacing livestock with insects could remove 18% of our greenhouse gas emissions and would be a great step towards ending climate change. Next, and perhaps most importantly, insects are incredibly efficient. With just 10 kilograms of feed, a locust population can produce 9 kilograms of edible food, whereas a cow can only produce 1 measly kilogram, while pigs can only produce 3 and chickens 5. A big reason for this increased efficiency in insects is that while all current livestock are warm-blooded animals, meaning energy is needed to generate heat for their bodies, insects are ectothermic, meaning they receive their heat from the environment. Because of this, they only need food to grow and move, not to stay warm. To make matters even better, insects aren't picky about what they'll eat, and they'll chop on just about anything, including rotten food and waste products from farms. Using just the food we waste every year, with the US alone throwing away 
away 141 trillion calories of food every day, we could sustain insect agriculture in large part just on our own trash. And while animals like cows waste food to build things that can't be eaten, like bones and skin, most of an insect is edible. In fact, about 80% of an insect's body is good for consumption, while only 40% of a cow's body is edible. For pigs and chickens, the number is slightly higher at 55%, but still nowhere close to that of an insect. Insects are far better with water conservation as well. While a cow requires roughly 3,300 liters of water to produce 100 grams of meat, an insect population would only require 1.6 liters of water, or 2,000 times less water to produce the same amount. This is because many insects, due to their size and physiology, receive most or all of the required water from the foods they eat, or even just through the air they breathe, and require no actual drinking water. In terms of growth, insects are rapid as well. It only takes crickets around three weeks to reach maturity, while a cow will take two years, and on average it takes 283 days for two cows to produce one calf, while a female cricket can lay up to 1,500 eggs. All this put together means insects are far less expensive to raise, much faster to grow, less hazardous to the environment, and more conservative in their eating habits. In other words, there's no advantage to farming cattle, or any other animal for that matter. But that's not all. The practice of eating insects called entomophagy has been recorded for nearly 30,000 years and for good reason, because insects are highly nutritious as well. Many insects are rich in nutrients like iron, zinc, dietary fiber, riboflavin, and vitamins A, B12, and D, which animal meats lack in any substantial quantities. In terms of protein, insects hold their own too. Take the simple house cricket. In one kilogram of raw house cricket, there's an average of 206 grams of protein. For comparison, in one kilogram of raw beef, there's 256 grams, which is a little more, but remember that raising that one kilogram of crickets took far less space, food, water, and time, and also offers other nutrients without any of the fats. They also don't transmit diseases. Because humans are so similar to animals like pigs and cows, diseases have a relatively easy time crossing between species. But insects are so radically different from us that virtually no insect disease can be transferred to humans, making them far safer to eat. Insects can also offer us of food security that we just can't find anywhere else. Today, 75% of our food is produced by just 12 plants like plantains, yams, sorghum, sweet potatoes, soybeans, cassavas, potatoes, rice, wheat, and corn, and five animals, pigs, goats, sheep, cows, and chickens. With something as vital as food, it's dangerous to rely on only a handful of species like we do now. If just one of these staple crops encountered a blight or other disease, global food production would take a hit and shortages would be expensive experienced everywhere. Things like this have happened before, and one doesn't need to look further than the Irish potato famine to be reminded of the risk and consequences of depending on one or only a few crops. But currently, we know about roughly 900,000 different insect species, and many experts say that's less than half the total number of insect species on the planet. Estimates range anywhere from 2 to 30 million total insect species. With such a great variety of insects, the issue of global food security would be greatly diminished, because if one of these species was unfortunately wiped out, we'd have many others to fall back on. Moreover, many people worry about the conditions our livestock are subjected to, being kept in small cages their entire lives, only to die once they reach a certain age. Insect agriculture, on the other hand, has proven to be far more humane of a process, as many insects naturally tend to live in high numbers in small spaces anyway. Now, some people may hear all this and think, well, that's all good and such, but, well, bugs are gross and I still don't want to eat them. And that's fair, I don't even want to eat something that looks like this. But of course, that's not how they look when all is said and done, just like how raw beef isn't nearly as appetizing as a prepared meal. Instead, alternative substances like this, called cricket flour, can be made. That's not so bad, right? I should also remind you that many cultures around the world consider insects a delicacy. To a lot of people, eating bugs is commonplace and actually even a treat. It's really only in Western culture that the stigma surrounding insects exists. I get that it's not ideal for many of us, but someday soon we may have no choice and let me ask you, between this and nothing, which would you rather eat? Thanks for watching, I hope I convinced some of you at least, but if not, that's fine too. Please leave a comment if you'd eat foods made with cricket flour, or maybe leave a good recipe you know that includes insects. And subscribe if you haven't, I'll be back next week with another video. Thanks.